This year, we've been doing a social media contest called the 100 Days, 100 Hours Gardening Challenge. We had seed companies and other organizations donate raffle prizes. Today, we're talking to one of them, the Snake River Seed Co-op. This is the Low Tech Podcast. Hello and welcome. I'm Scott Johnson from Low Technology Institute, your host for podcast number 56 on September 30th, 2022, coming to our the Low Tech Institute's recording room in Cooksville, Wisconsin. Thanks so much for joining us today. We're talking with three folks from the Snake River Seed Co-op uh, leadership team. Uh, don't forget to follow us on Twitter. Our handle is at low underscore techno. Like us on Facebook, find us on Instagram, subscribe to us on YouTube, and check out our website lowtechinstitute.org, where you can find both of our podcasts as well as information about joining and supporting the Institute and its research. Also, some podcast distributors put ads on podcasts. Unless you hear me doing the ad, someone else is making money on it advertising. While all of our podcasts, videos, and other information are given freely, they do take resources to make. And if you're in a position to help support our work and be part of this community, please consider becoming a monthly supporter for as little as $3 a month through our Patreon page, patreon.com slash lowtechinstitute. If you'd like to sponsor an episode directly, please get in touch with us through our website, lowtechinstitute.org. So today we are joined by uh, three folks from the Snake River Seed Co-op. Um, so why don't uh, you guys go around the table and introduce yourselves so people can associate a, a name with your with your voice here. So uh, who are you? What do you do at, at uh, do you just, do you say CRCS or what do you, what do you say for Snake River Seed Co-op for short? Uh, yeah, you can refer to it as SRSC. That's fine. It's Snake okay. River Seed Cooperative or Snake River Seed Co-op or Snake River Seed Cooperative Inc. Now, um, yeah, and I can start the round of introductions. I'm Danny O'Malley. I've been working with SRSC for about two years now. I'm the operations manager and wholesale accounts manager. And I've got a background in, I've worked on several farms, a year-round CSA farm over in Buell, Idaho. My wife and I had a farm in Northern California. And then I've also worked on a pretty large scale, um, well, I would say me medium scale farm here in Boise, Idaho. Um, I'm Riley Carney, and my title at Snake River Seeds is finance manager. I also do our seed production side of the business, so making sure that crops are assigned to growers each year with the appropriate quantity for growers and for us. And I had my own little farm as well um, for several years. I just ended that recently. Basically, COVID threw a wrench into everything, and I just wasn't able to farm anymore. Um, so, yep, that's my story. What about you, Mary Kay? Hi, uh, I'm the marketing manager here at Snake River Seed Cooperative. Uh, and also communications or community outreach coordinator. Um, and I've got a 20 plus year background in marketing. As far as farming goes, you could call me a pandemic era gardener. I really got serious about it in 2020 as a response, kind of inspired by the Victory Gardens, but going into it with an awareness of um, the World War II aspect of it with the internment of the Japanese causing the need for um, a full-scale, localized reimagining of the Victory Victory Garden era. Um, cool. I'm also affiliated with Cooperative Gardens Commission. Excellent. Well, welcome to all three of you. Thanks for taking time out of your schedules today. Um, luckily, hopefully, we're coming down out of the busy season, but not quite there yet. So would one of you be able to tell me a little bit more about SRSC or Snake River Seed Co-op? Um, how long has it been around? What was the kind of original goal? Why, why, why was it started? Yeah, Snake River Seeds was started, um, basically it came out of two different organizations. One was Earthly Delights Farm, and the other was a um, Commonwealth Seed Library. So Earthly Delights Farm, uh, the, co the owner of that farm was Casey O'Leary, and she has been farming um, for over a decade. She now has moved on to uh, being a horticulture teacher at our local community college. So at the time, this was eight years ago when Snake River Seeds was founded, and both of those organizations, Early Delights Farm, was saving seeds and uh, selling them under their own label, just Early Delights Farm Seeds. And then the Commonwealth Seed Library was bringing in seeds from seed savers in the region and just trying to keep, you know, keep the seeds flowing. But what Casey found was that the farm side of that situation was uh, just much more productive. There were more seeds moving through compared to the library. So she had the idea that if we can get a lot of different seed savers kind of gathered together through a business, 
then we would be able to move more seeds through the region, produce more seeds um, that are regionally adapted compared to those two businesses or, you know, one was a nonprofit and one was mm -hmm. a business. So she kind of combined the two with her friend, Carrie Jones. So they mm -hmm. co-founded Snake River Seed Co-op. Oh, excellent. Has that overall um, ethos or uh, founding mission changed in the last eight years or has it largely been able to stay intact and or, or take on new missions maybe? Yeah, the mission has remained the same, and that mission is to empower uh, Intermountain West farmers and gardeners to plant, grow, save, and share locally adapted seeds. Mm -hmm. So that mission has remained the same, but the methods, I would say our methods have changed over time mm -hmm. with how we approach that, how we can um, just bring that into the business. Okay. And how many, how many farmers in that region are involved with the co-op? Yes, yeah, so we work with about 50 different growers is what mm -hmm. we call them. We do okay. work with small scale seed savers. Mm -hmm. So some are just a backyard gardener who is saving one seed crop with us. Sure. And then we also work with growers who have many acres of organic farm production. So we've got that full scale. Excellent. Yeah, we're actually neighbors with a place called Agricole. It's a prairie seed uh, company, and they have large scale monocrops of prairie seeds so that they can make mixes. And so it's beautiful to drive by their place because it looks like a patchwork quilt. It's, you know, purple and then yellow and then blue and then green and all these different flowers, which usually would grow intermixed in a prairie, but they grow them obviously with modified industrial equipment. It's an amazing operation, but this is, you guys are much more a distributed network of small, medium, and I suppose you have some large farmers as well. Yeah, we work with a few farms that are, that we consider to be large. They're still mm -hmm. probably kind of small in terms sure. of this industrial sized Right. farms yeah. getting well, bigger and bigger. I would say the majority of our farmers that we work with have under 10 acres. Okay. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. So seeds are kind of the central component here. So let's kind of shift and talk about those. I see on your website, which is snakeriverseeds.com, you have the word seed shed all over that website. So what is a seed shed? What is that? And, and why is it so important that it's on your website so often? Yeah. So the seed shed, uh, we love this, or I love personally this visual. <laughs> I'm sure my coworkers do too. Um, it's basically when you think about the watershed and there's, you know, it's a cycle of water that's moving through an area. We think of our seed shed in the same way. Mm -hmm. So seeds are coming from farmers to our office. So it's kind of like the farmers are like a river, river of seeds coming into our office here. This mm -hmm. is like a puddle that's growing with seeds. Um, mm -hmm. I love that, just thinking about all of them coming here. And then we distribute them, we package them up and send them out to customers, which mostly include gardeners in our region, mm -hmm. as well as farmers who are planting our seeds for food crops. Sure. Um, so that, that flow of seeds is really important to us because that's how we adapt the seeds each year is by growing them continually. Whereas a lot of um, seed banks prefer to just store the seeds. And mm. when they're doing that, they're, they're basically frozen in time. So they're not adapting to any climatic changes that are happening. Okay, sure. And so, yeah, uh, we kind of have access, thanks to, you know, our global supply chain now, uh, we have access to seeds from all, all over the world. Um, I'm growing, for example, a Ukrainian wheat, not for any political expediency uh, this year with uh, the events in Ukraine, but just happened to be, I'm growing Ukrainian wheat, and then I'll send back some back to the, the bank that that came from, and the rest I'll distribute out here or eat. If, if you're you know, new to an area or you want to take on a new crop, when is it best to bring in something and then over a few years or a, a generation adapt it to where you are locally? And when is it best to look into already locally adapted? Or is there no real good answer for that? So yes, yeah, so we live specifically in the inter Intermountain West. That's where we are focused mm -hmm. with our efforts. Um, we respect other regions and hope mm -hmm. that they can do the same, you know, grow sure. their seed, regional seed shed. And in our region, the great majority of um, the food that we grow here is not native here. Mm -hmm. there, there was not agriculture happening in the valley where we live prior to settlers moving here, uh, European descendants. Right. So in our mind, pretty much all of the varieties that we're that we're producing are not land raised. They have been brought in from somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So it is important for us to be able to do that because it isn't something that's already here. Whereas other regions do have that, you know, long history of agriculture. 
like in uh, southwestern United States. Right. So they do have varieties that they can grow that are land races, um, but we we don't have that as much. So that's something that we are just kind of always working on and selecting varieties to bring in that already do really well. That's that's basically how our growers introduce a crop is they have to come to me and say, hey, I really love this variety. I'm already growing it. And now I want to save the seed and produce that for other customers as well. So so I wanted to ask, I imagine uh, you guys probably already have a good answer for this, but what's your stance on patenting seeds and the legal there's other related legal structures that kind of restrict people from using and sharing seeds, even reusing their own seeds. I'd be interested to hear your stance on that. Yeah, we do believe that that is unethical to patent seeds and for a couple of reasons. So usually seeds are produced um, either by selection mm -hmm. or by hybridization mm -hmm. or by genetic modification. Right. So for the, the first two, selection and hybridization, the plant is being produced with the help of a human being, mm -hmm. but the, the characteristics that the plant is showing are already there within the plant. It's not something that the human invented. So just patenting something that already exists in nature doesn't make any sense to us. Mm -hmm. And then kind of on the more ethical side, we love our seeds that we work with. We mm -hmm. know they are living beings and we treat them with respect as much as we can. We treat them as living beings that are with us right now. And when people are genetically modifying uh, seeds through gene editing, we mm -hmm. honestly see that as not being really consensual. The seed is, mm -hmm. is a sovereign entity in our mind. It's mm -hmm. a living mm -hmm. being that we respect and we just don't don't think that that is respectful at all. <laughs> just to say that is something that I've learned from indigenous seed keepers just mm -hmm. over the years. Mm -hmm. It'd be interesting if, I don't know if anyone's trying this, maybe you guys would know. Um, I know that some rivers or, or even some animals have gotten legal protections in some countries as, uh, as you know, uh, beings on par with humans in terms of having rights and things, even if they can't necessarily express them. Maybe somebody should be working for seed citizenship or something like that, where they would get some sort of rights uh, where, yeah, like, editing their genes without their consent, which they're not going to give, uh, <laughs> would, be, would be helpful. And so the main reason I found you guys is we, we were doing a, uh, a gardening uh, challenge this summer. We were challenging folks, mostly on social media, but elsewhere, also to, uh, to spend more time in the garden, like Mary Kay, you were talking about Victory Gardens. Just so happens in 2020, during the uh, beginning of the pandemic, we had already planned to try and grow all our own food that year. So in January, we started, and then in February, <laughs> COVID actually became a big deal. Um, so it worked out really well for us because uh, we, we had already bought all our seeds and things like that. But this last year, yeah, we challenged people to spend 100 hours uh, in their gardens over 100 days, which is probably a bit of a steep challenge. Uh, maybe we should do it with less hours. Uh, I think that may have been intimidating. Uh, but you guys donated seed packs, which will be probably here in the next week or two, drawing participants and, and, and sending them out. Um, so hopefully we'll get some people in touch with you guys. So first off, I want to say thank you guys for for being being part of that i thought the challenge was good i thought 100 hours seems reasonable for trying to grow any substantial amount of food right um, but we're glad you're doing the challenge yeah yeah i'm so glad to have you guys on board and yeah it it seems 100 hours isn't a lot when you're growing subsistence levels amounts of food but uh it, otherwise it might seem a lot i don't know so we'll we'll see uh it's 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 hard sometimes i spend and you guys probably also spend so much time outside um, I get home from work, get home from work. I work from home. <laughs> We're based uh, in our residence. But when I'm done with work and my wife has been working all day, she's like, let's go for a walk. Or if she wants to eat lunch outside, I'm like, oh, I've been outside in the sun all day. I want to be inside. Uh, anyway, so speaking of my organization, maybe we have some folks listening who are big uh, Snake River fans and are coming new to us. Um, so we... <laughs> My organization, uh, Low Technology Institute, talks about what things are going to be in a quarter century when we don't have as much access to gas, diesel, and other oil products, among other things. But that's going to be, I think, the big deciding factor. This is where we're going to change how we grow food. And so I know this is kind of speculation on your guys' part, but you have experience with this. So is a locally distributed co-op model useful for folks as we become more local in our distribution networks? Would this be a, a useful model or would you guys lean towards something else? Mm, yeah, that's a good question. Um, 
You know, the the image I like to think of when we're asked this question is just like many hands holding the seeds. So you know, Snake River Seed Co-op has operated in the cooperative spirit uh, since the beginning, really. But only within like the last nine or so months, we've had um, employee and grower ownership. That really means a lot to us. We operate as a benefit corporation. Um, it took us a long, a long path to get to actually officially becoming employee and grower owned. Just really last summer, we started the conversations, had a steering committee, worked with a really great local attorney. And the value we see in cooperative ownership is really what you're talking about is Mm -hmm. being resilient in uncertain times. And then, you know, especially we could, you know, the original owner, Casey O'Leary, she could have sold the business to somebody else, most likely with good intentions, but then you never quite know exactly what the outcome of that sale will be. And so we're, we're really proud of the fact that we are cooperatively owned and our governance structure is really based on centering the voices of those with the most day-to-day work in that area. Mm-hmm. And so we listen to our growers' concerns and needs. It's paramount, you know, to what we do. So definitely, um, I'm not sure if that totally answers your question. Uh, it seems yeah. like we're definitely in in the same vein and committed to a lot of the same values. And if we look at uh, the seeds themselves, so for example, uh, in 2018, we did a potato growing study with USDA funding. And when I had to do comparative literature research for this grant, I was doing non-mechanized potato growing methods, right? And it was real easy because nobody had ever done any studies with non-mechanized potato growing methods with the USDA in the last 150 years, because everybody's mechanized with everything, especially commodity crops like potatoes, for example. And so it was really easy for me to say, oh, we're comparing five different potato growing methods, non-mechanized potato growing methods for market gardeners uh, who might not have potato harvesting equipment. And they're like, oh, great. And we got funded. But that's just you know one crop, one example of how things would change if we're not able to use our tractors, use our large-scale powered implements. So how, how do you think maybe seeds that you guys deal with a lot, I don't know, maybe if you could pull an example or two, how would they change, if at all, when we'd be doing a lot more hand work in the gardens? Or maybe you already have some growers who prefer to use more hand methods for crops. We talked about this, you know, generally speaking, we would be looking for drought hardy, short season, mm. long keeping plant varieties that will, those will be really critical for mm. localizing our individual and community food supply. Mm-hmm. Um, looking at things that could be grown vertically, using water really carefully. Mm. It's very precious out here. So we have a lot of lettuces, a lot of mustard greens, and there is a fair amount of, I'm like branching a little bit out of our region here and then I'll bring it back in. But there's a fair amount of exploration in hydroponic and aquaponic efforts. For example, mm-hmm. um, Microsoft main offices in the Washington, you know, Seattle, Washington sure. area, supplies their whole cafeteria with fresh greens readily using an aquaponic system that's vertically situated. But outside of that, a few friends here and one fellow visiting our booth at Farmers Market a couple of months ago in Boise. I'm not aware to aware of a scaled up effort in the mm. Intermountain West. And I, I hope I hear about one now that I've said it out loud on a recording. Yeah. Um, my coworkers here were pointing out that, you know, that involves plastic. So it's not mm. really like venturing out of fossil fuel, but I actually live in like a little permaculture collective household. Oh, cool. And my house housemate landlord does do aquaponics. We, I mean, we have like a little pond in the backyard mm-hmm. powered by goldfish that are really mm-hmm. robust. They yeah. overwinter. And then he's recycled like rain gutters. And he's got like lob, you know, broken up lava rock and there's things grown out of that. I actually snapped some photos when I was home for lunch just so I could share it and prove it and whatever. And then, you know, uh, we have so much, so much stuff in our, in our world right now that could be repurposed that wouldn't involve, you know, utilizing new fossil fuels that could still accomplish a similar situation. Say there's lots of PVC that, you know, without municipal water uh, being pumped because all of that's driven by... Uh, grid energy, which is largely fossil fuel derived, uh, you know, there's probably a lot of extra water lines out there that would could be uh, pulled up and turned into if if that's what you wanted to do. Yeah, you know, so much infrastructure. I mean, we we you know we have land out here, but uh, we are also in a big development boom. But that's venturing off the topic a bit. Then there's the recent situation with tomatoes in California, causing pretty big concern about general large scale supply for tomatoes. Uh, labor impacts from COVID, Mm -hmm. rising fuel and fertilizer costs, increased demand and strain in that situation, plus drought and fire season. There's concern about national availability for tomatoes next season. So large-scale producers like 
some of your ketchup producers and whatnot are already looking to develop drought resistant varieties but mm. um so saving tomato seeds that survived this hot dry summer in mm. this region can help bring a sense of security in that crop locally and i found in the community garden school garden that I've been working on this year where I definitely got my hundred hours in. We we did all right. Like some of those tomatoes went for three or four days without watering. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of learning by suggestion and learning by from experienced other gardeners or even scientists that are like, you know, I hear you can actually dry farm to tomatoes. So mm -hmm. I gave that a shot and they they did better when they didn't mm -hmm. get water over the water anyway yeah i just picked some tomatoes today and i was uneven i was we were gone for the weekend and so i had uneven watering and i had some cracked tomatoes uh because they were so used to even watering but yeah selecting for and for you guys i think drought is so much more of a driving issue than you know for us in wisconsin occasionally we have dry years but we also have very very wet years do you guys get unusually wet years or is it pretty much unusually dry years all the time now Wouldn't yeah i think it's more. primarily unusually dry years all the time it just rained here for like three minutes and we're like, oh my God, let's go stand outside and look at the rain. <laughs> um, yeah, and then to kind of like uh, piggyback on what Mary Kay was saying, you know, that's why we choose to focus so heavily on the Intermountain West and on our regional area because of these like, you know, fears and concerns is one reason, but the other reason is just we, you know, we really support small local growers anyway. Mm -hmm. We don't really necessarily sell our seed to larger scale farmers. We're not really at that scale. And mm -hmm. so we're really in service to the local producers. And so providing them things that are easy for them to grow and harvest without machines is is mm -hmm. super important to us. Oh, that's wonderful. Are there other groups? So you guys talk about being situated in the Intermontane West. Are there other groups like you that you know of in other regions that I don't know, maybe folks listening in other parts of the U.S. or the world uh, could look up? Uh, Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance, for one. Uh, there's not a lot of regionally sourced seed companies mm. at this time. There are some that are moving in that direction, which is really exciting, mm -hmm. and hopefully they'll continue, but it does have some challenges because it is putting a boundary around where you are in your business and saying, mm. this is it. This is sure. the only place where we will source our seeds, so that does create some challenges. Yeah, unfortunately, it looks like the our market pushes people to do things that are not long-term helpful for. <laughs> yeah, we have that discussion all the time. And as a values-based business, we continue to just stay within the Intermountain West. We sell seeds online to you know whoever will buy them, but sure. all of our wholesale accounts and all of our growers are in the Intermountain West. Another helpful resource for people are seed swaps, seed libraries for people that are looking for those locally adapted seeds. And also, I would imagine, um, at least I know in this area, there's a lot of Native American groups that are actively working on maintaining and uh, reviving um, their own local varieties and things that have been, at least in this play, in this area, you know, corn uh, and other things that have been grown here for, oh, I don't know, a couple centuries or more. And so, uh, you know, those would be very locally adapted uh, longevity and all kinds of variety and, and all hand harvested and things like that. So people might avail themselves of local groups uh, if they're around, if they're willing to work and share outside their communities. We do have, we do carry some drought hardy native species that are native to our area um, mm -hmm. that have been traditionally used by the indigenous communities in, in the Intermountain West. Like Kinopodia um, type things or? Like berries, some, some herb varieties, flowers. Mm and grasses have been used for medicine, have been used for food that have high nutrient value, things that could be, you know, stocked because this has been a really hard area to live in without all of the um, alterations that we brought with it or brought to it, I should say. Um, so the people here, from what I've learned from Indigenous Idaho Alliance in conversation, is that traditionally it was a seasonal, people, people moved around seasonally. They moved mm -hmm. to where the salmon were for right. fishing they moved to the mountains and they had caches of food different seasons of the year but you know our varied vegetables and fruit trees that that's something that we've been cultivating Please. i'm probably missing some foods that have, have grown here naturally in the desert sure. that we have no idea about we don't carry those seeds yeah unfortunately uh so it's kind of funny in anthropology there's kind of a joke that like oh 
there's so much emphasis on the, the hunting of hunter-gatherer. When we're talking deep time, right? Because, well, what do we find in the archaeological record? We find uh, arrowheads and spear points and things like that. We don't find the baskets. We don't find the, the food. We don't find the remains of, of all the food that was gathered. And across cultures, this is a generalization, but across cultures, many times, women and children were doing most of the gathering. And they were also getting most of the calories, anywhere from 60 to 95% of the calories were women, you know, the women and the children were, were doing it because it's something you could put up and put down. But we don't see it archaeologically. So there was forever uh, overvaluation of the contribution of, of hunting to these societies, whereas gathering would have been by far gathering and, and then propagating and also growing food would have been by far the most important input into people's diets. I mean, yeah, it's just, it's really a shame that we can't reconstruct quite everything because there's probably some pretty great or at least interesting food out there that we're missing. Uh, so I used to be an anthropologist and archaeologist. And so, yeah, seasonal sedentism was seen all across the world right before people started to really get intensively into agriculture. And so, you know, imagine doing this seasonal sedentism and then maybe grandma or grandpa gets sick or breaks a leg or something and can't move with the camp. So maybe you start to be more sedentary. So you focus more on the plants around you and things like that. And that's one way that domestication may have happened. And uh, you guys are so close to one of the richest natural environments, the, the West Coast, where people could live in these really large permanent settlements uh, because the land was so rich. You guys definitely are in that rain shadow that makes it a lot more difficult. But yeah, we're starting to wind down on time here. So I, I just want to say thank you guys all so much for taking a little time out of your day to chat uh, with me about uh, the, the co-op and kind of your outlook on you know what's important for seeds and growing co-ops and uh, people uh, working together to preserve seeds and grow food and kind of think about the future a little bit with me. I appreciate that. Asking kind of oddball questions, uh, you guys playing, playing so nicely. Are there places uh, besides SnakeRiverSeeds.com? Um, are there places online that people could find you or uh, learn more about what you guys do or have going on? Yeah, you can follow us on Facebook or Instagram. Both of those are linked on uh, snakeriverseeds.com. And I'll put them um, in the show notes too. Yeah. And then since we're, you know, since we're regionally focused, all of our wholesale accounts are in the Intermountain West. So anywhere in Idaho, we have got about 70 wholesale accounts in Idaho, Wyoming, Utah, Oregon. Mm -hmm. And we just got our first one in Nevada this past year. And so we don't, or, you know, snakeriverseeds.com is the only place online that you can buy them. Uh, okay. But if you're in the Intermountain West, go check out your local garden center. And if they don't have us, let us know. <laughs> oh, yeah. Good, good point. Good point. But yeah, you guys are, it's great that you guys are there. To, I, I like that you started as a seed bank. That That's really, that's really fun. And now we're. I've turned that into a larger scale business to, to share those seeds with everybody. So thanks again so much for taking some time out to chat with me today. And now for a brief recap of the research we have going on around the Institute. We had a member event this last weekend, picking apples, and we had a dozen people out and we were in our orchard. We picked apples for the afternoon and pressed cider. So that was a lot of fun. Uh, if you want to find out more about more member events, please sign up as a member on our website, as I mentioned before, or patreon.com slash Institute. Uh, we also demonstrated thatching at an event called the Wisconsin Permaculture Convergence. So feel free to check that out on their website for next year's Permaculture Convergence. Please ignore the crying in the background. That's my daughter. We do have a couple of, of things coming up, a prairie seed gathering event. And we also have two other things coming up. On the 8th of October, we have a free prairie seed collection workshop find out information at our website, lowtechinstitute.org. And then on the 9th, we'll be demonstrating coopering, that is making small buckets in the village of New Glarus, Wisconsin, at the Heritage Festival for the historic uh, New Glarus Village Museum there. You'll be able to find out more information on our website. That's it for this week. The Low Tech Podcast is put out by the Low Technology Institute. The show is hosted and co-produced by me, Scott Johnson, and co-produced and edited by Hina Suzuki. This episode was recorded in the Low Technology Institute's recording room which still needs more soundproofing uh, subscribe to this podcast on itunes spotify google play youtube and elsewhere we hope you enjoyed this free podcast if you'd like to join the community and help support the work we do please consider going to patreon.com slash institute and signing up thanks to our forester and land steward level members marilyn skirpon sam b and the hamvises and i do just want to note i met sam uh randomly this last weekend when i was demonstrating thatching so that was great to meet some of the people that help us and support our community uh people I know in person and some are from far away so thank you to everybody and I hope to meet many of you at uh, random future times so thanks again
again. Low Technology Institute is a 501c3 research organization supported by members, grants, and underwriting. You can find out more information about the Low Technology Institute membership and underwriting at lowtechinstitute.org. Find us on social media and reach me directly at scott at lowtechinstitute.org. Our intro music was Ancient Memories off the album Forager by Holizna. That song is in the public domain. This podcast is under the Creative Commons Attribution and Share Alike license, meaning you're free to use and share it as long as you give us credit. Thanks so much and take care.